Okay, Brian, so my first question is, uh, you have predicted that in 2011 um, there would be an explosion of content curation uh, and of various tools about it. So what do you think, what did you notice, what impressed you about these tools and the figure of the content curator? And did you see further developments for content curation? Content curation has experienced tremendous adoption this year. Uh, and we'll continue to do so in 2011 as the tools become easier and also, uh, what's the right word, more glamorous to use, where they actually present data in a very readable format for the people who are following those people who are curating. Uh, the other thing that I have noticed is that it has taken away from proactive content creation because it is so easy to take the content of others and just put or wrap your words around it. But... To what extent that has had an impact, I'm not sure. But it is profound because it does allow, for example, the formation of not just curation-based uh, conversations or engagement, but curation-based interest graphs. So, for example, you and I have interests in technology, maybe new media, mobile media, and the content that I curate uh, and that I put my impressions upon might have interest to you. So, therefore, our relationship grows stronger based on the content that I'm packaging to share with you. Extremely clear. I will thank uh, Giuseppe Mauriello for, uh, for that question. And thank I'm going you, Giuseppe. To... <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm going to go on with the following one, which is by Fabrizio Farapo. And, it, uh, and he asks, uh, there are many services that measure influence, but what is, in Brian's opinion, influence? None of these tools measure influence at all. They measure social capital uh, as it relates to how someone might interact in Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, but it does not measure influence. Influence is not a word that can be manipulated by new media or technology. Influence is very clear in how it's defined. It is the ability to cause effect or change behavior. Clout, peer index, mblast, you name it they track sort of a standing based on their own proprietary algorithms of say you and me in a particular network um, and it, even even to that extent some could argue that that social capital algorithm is incorrect because social capital is something that's earned and it's also spent as you interact not just in digital networks but in real life the true measure of influence is to test those numbers so for example we see a lot of brands who that are giving away products and, and uh, experiences to consumers who have a score of 50 or higher, for example. What does that mean? Well, as a brand, you can test that. You could say, we have 60% unawareness in, in the marketplace, and we would like to increase awareness, so we will do these things, and we will change behavior. Or it could be as simple as, we will cause the effect of people recommending our products or people buying our products. Those have outcomes, but the true measure of influence is going to be the person at the end measuring what happened after the campaign. Um, a further question by Francesca Ferrara is about um, new publishing tools. So the question is, uh, the publishing startups that regard the birth of new online newspapers, what do you think are the errors that they should not do and how could they enhance their business model? Well, <laughs> that sounds like I could solve a lot of problems in one answer. <laughs> I can tell you that I've talked to a good number of new media properties that are asking these very questions because they are taking quite traditional business models and packaging them in a new format. Uh, and also, not just a new format, but in terms of how they structure their, uh, their employees. I'm actually asked this question quite a bit, and I've worked with a lot of new media properties to help them solve uh, business model questions and problems for the future. It's, it's ironic that many of them actually begin with traditional business models in terms of how they monetize their properties. Uh, but what is noticeably different is how they're structuring uh, their employee framework uh, and the types of monetization strategies that they're considering. It's really interesting how content becomes 
a play here where original series um, engaging types of um, experiences uh, become monetizable. So you don't necessarily have to sit there and, and watch a, uh, or a pre or post roll ad on, on a particular content or have some really horrible island come floating over the content as you experience it so that you have to be forced to go through this advertisement. There are ways to create an experience that people will enjoy. Uh, it just takes, I don't want to just say creativity, but it also takes a way to make people feel like it's worthy of, it, of, of engaging, right? So let me, let me put out a, a challenge to anybody creating a new media property. We live in an era where people can skip ads, whether it's on television, whether it's online. If you look at any heat map study on where eyeballs are focused on the screen, it's never on the advertisements. It's always on the content. So what if you made the ad worthy of engagement? What if you made the advertisement something that was so compelling, something that was so fascinating that it not only sucked you in, but also made you share it? That's what the future of this is all about. It's not just about consuming. It's about sharing. And we live in a world where sharing is, is actually taken for granted. We have the ability to share content, and we don't appreciate the ability. This is, goes back to our question about curation earlier. We don't appreciate the ability to actually package these things and share them with others in ways that actually improve our dialogue. Advertisement, monetization, these are all things that can be part of it. We're just not thinking about it that way. Old Spice did a great job in terms of making commercials that were so fascinating and so funny that it was worthy of sharing. Evian Roller Babies. And these are just two classic examples of what are basically advertisements. But what if you made original series out of them? What if you made them something that I, I had to share with you because it was so fascinating? It's a difference in methodology and a difference in philosophy. But those can be monetizable and those can be packaged and sold. Okay, so I have a few further questions from other readers. Uh, one is uh, Roberto Favini, who has quite a few questions for you. So the first one is, uh, which skill or role is now lacking in uh, media companies? How must the organizing level of a media company change to be able to manage contemporarily old and new media? And when you ask about media company, do we, are we referring to a newspaper or a um, publication or, or a television? Uh, I don't think it's, it's not specified, but I think he intends all of these. Well, you, if you think about it, they are those, they are amongst what I call digital Darwinism. They are the greatest threatened types of industries in digital Darwinism. And digital Darwinism is when consumer behavior, um, technology, where all of these things start to evolve faster than your ability to adapt. And as we saw with digital, especially in Web 1.0 and, and now in Web 2.0 and social media, media was greatly threatened because it was democratized to create content and distribute content. That's why we see so many individuals now who have sort of risen above even the most uh, sacred of brands uh, out there. However, it's also an opportunity for a renaissance for these properties to recognize that they can plug in to a, what I call the human network, you and me, our connections, uh, that we share all of these interests. We can take really fascinating stories or, or experiences that we see on television because we'll take our devices with us everywhere we go, uh, or you and I on this notebook. It's very easy for me to now take content and push it. We live in a society where it's easier to share content than it is, honestly, to create it, no matter how easy it is to create a blog or create a Tumble account. Uh, the reality is, is that it's easier to take something and just push it out. So whereas we're a curator, we're also a publisher, but really what we're doing is sharing very interesting content. CNN uh, in America shared some very interesting stats that I don't have in front of me, but it was to what extent their stories were shared on Twitter. And it was something astounding, like one story every second from CNN.com was shared on Twitter. And if you think about the social effect of that, it now has the ability to bring people that they couldn't reach anymore or that they couldn't reach in general 
because they're now relying on people to bring their social graphs in to things that are related to them. Now, I want to also introduce you to a different concept, and that is the concept of the end of the destination web. You and I probably don't spend as much time going to www.site.com. We probably land on it because we have we saw it in our Twitter stream, our Facebook status, somebody emailed it to us. So our attention is now focusing on these streams. Any media company can realize that that's a tremendous opportunity. How do you get people to share something? Well, first you have to make it incredibly easy. How hard is it for you to comment on a traditional media site today? It's, it's, it's ridiculously impossible. Proprietary networks, register your name. I have 65 accounts on 65 different media companies when I could just click Facebook or Twitter or something that I use today to make it a lot easier. This is something, again, that has to start from the top, that we recognize that this is a new opportunity and to what extent that we embrace new technology in a way that not just stops digital Darwinism, but also gives us an opportunity to embrace new business models. This has everything to do with the people running these companies not actually using any of these new technologies themselves. I believe leadership is something that has to be earned, and we will not, I, I hope, that we'll see a great revolution in leadership before we'll see the demise of some of these great media companies. Um, one further question is uh, the following. In 2012, will we see co-creation as the evolution of social CRM? That's a very interesting way to phrase that question. No. Social CRM is a, a series of processes, technologies, and methodologies for managing customer relationships. In fact, if we had to dissect that, more companies will place emphasis on the M for management than they will on the R for relationship. Co-creation is an act, meaning that people, regardless of whether you want them to or not, are going to share their experiences about your company within their human networks. You have an ability to shape and steer those experiences, but many companies don't necessarily realize that they have that opportunity before them. So, for example, uh, I've done these, these studies with, with airlines, for example, where you could see if I were a, I call them connected customers, people who are connected to one another through mobile devices, social networks, that will not go to Google to make a decision. They'll go to their social network before they make a decision. And they will ask, what should I fly? Which airline do you love? And the answers that come back say everything. And I take those answers and I create a word cloud to show what happens if I say this particular airline, what are people saying about it right now? And it's astounding of what you will find. And those businesses don't even recognize that that is their brand in the connected consumerism world or the connected consumer world. So I take the website of that airline and I compare it to the word cloud of what people are saying about the airline and they're vastly different, right? On one side, you might have horrible experiences. On this side, it's great, wonderful, innovative, leading, friendly. That's not co-creation. Co-creation first starts with the recognition of this world and trying to dissect or understand what is causing these experiences and then starting to do something that fixes those experiences. That's co-creation. CRM one day might recognize that this is something for not just uh, understanding but collaboration. But right now, it's about a process. You have a problem. Uh, we're trying to sell to you. These are the things that we know you've liked or that you've purchased before. They are not right now on a path for collision. Right now, they are on separate paths, and it's the work of people like me and others who are really trying to educate decision makers that this is a new world of which we're trying to compete, and it actually takes a whole new approach. What are the most common mistakes in doing social media monitoring? <laughs> well, I could spend hours with you, couldn't I? You have many <laughs> questions. The, the, the biggest mistake in social media monitoring is that we just monitor our, our, our brand mentions uh, and the sentiment. 
and that we maybe even compare them to competitive mentions and competitive sentiment. And then we take these reports and we say, here's how many times we were mentioned versus our competitors and the positive sentiment versus negative sentiment. Look how wonderful we're doing. Look at how this has progressed day over day. We get into this report cycle. We give it to management. Management says, this is wonderful. This is exactly why we're getting into social media. What can we do to increase those mentions? And then we get caught up on a treadmill or a wheel of meaningless data. It's not about what people are saying. It's about what people are not saying. It's not about how many mentions you have. It's about how many mentions you don't have. It's not about how many likes or comments or tweets or followers you have. It's about how many you don't have. See, we're at the beginning of all of this, and we're building infrastructure around what is versus what isn't. And what isn't is the bigger opportunity. That's where the future of business lies. Social media monitoring, by default, creates a reactive business model, meaning somebody says something, we do something. You have a problem, we react. Co-creation is about being proactive, meaning we don't, we don't have enough conversations about positive experiences. We don't have enough people saying how much they love us. We don't have, enough, uh, we don't have a high enough net promoter score. So what are we going to do to drive increases in volumes and amplification around that? That's what this is about. Social media monitoring is a reactive, maybe even administrative level process when we need to actually be a lot more strategic in causing the things that we want to measure so that our administrators, social media monitoring side, will have some to process and report. By the way, there's a difference also between social media monitoring and intelligence. And it is intelligence where I believe the future of business lies. For example, I could tell you that, and you could look at two reports I wrote. One is the, the Starbucks and the interest graph report, which you could Google. To say, it's not how many people follow Starbucks. It's about what is important to the people who follow Starbucks and how you can glean intelligence from what people are saying, what people are doing, even outside of the mentions of the product name. What's important to them? What do they love? What are they sharing? All of that data is there, and those insights should inform greater strategies that, by the way, will be met with, with resounding applause because you took the time to figure out what mattered to people. Okay, so one uh, last question by Stefan Mitzella is, what are, you, in your opinion, the ingredients, the fundamental ingredients to go from a social media strategy to a social business strategy? And what are the obstacles that, based on your experience, block many companies along this way? That is a great question. Um, it's a great question because that's, that it demonstrates that we're thinking in the right way. Right now, most businesses who are using social media are actually social brands. Um, one stat to share with you is that social media is actually already in a silo in most organizations. By that, I mean marketing, marketing communications, and public relations are the top one, two, and three divisions that actually own it. Customer service, sales, HR, finance, they're, a, they're at the bottom, if at all, on the list. <clears throat> That already says that we are not on a path for social business because it's already in one division. It's locked in one division, which means all you're going to see on Facebook and Twitter are contests, promotions, links. The social business assumes that, number one, the departments are talking to each other. I have an article coming out in a, in a little bit that talks about what I call the horseshoe of, of customer experiences, where if you have a problem with customer service... You look at social media today. On one end is customer service traditional, and on the other end is social media. And sometimes, if you have a problem, the company will say, oh, we see your problem. If you tweeted it on Twitter, for example, we see your problem, but we're owned in marketing. We don't necessarily know how to fix that problem. You are phone number, or here's our email address, or here's our website to report your problem, try to you know, get you out of the picture. Or they'll ignore it because they're just not qualified to respond to it. And that creates a big gap between here and here, demonstrating the lack of social business infrastructure. I actually don't believe the future of this is about social business at all. I actually believe it's about what I call an adaptive business. A social business 
assumes too much great power in social media, when in fact social media is just one part of this evolution. That's like saying, are you an email business? Uh, yeah. You know, I suppose sale use, sales uses email and HR uses email. Social media are just channels. They're channels that are wonderful because it gives you direct access to your customers, your stakeholders, your influencers. But it's what you put in those channels that matter. And it's how you work with the departments that say, we have this person who has this problem or who needs this resolution, and how we work together to use those channels to, to improve experiences. The thing that's missing in most businesses today is an adaptable infrastructure or a culture of customer centricity or a culture of one. And I say one because that me we don't act as one company. We act as different business functions in silos. That's, and that's okay. That's worked for 100 years. But now the future of all of this is an adaptive business model where we can recognize trends and emerging opportunities and changes in consumer behavior where we, we can change or bring about change within the organization so that other people who haven't worked together will work together to build better customer experiences. Then social media can be one of the ways that those customer experiences are fortified. I will say this. It's what my whole book is about right now. It's called The End of Business as Usual. The first half says, I think actually the first words are, this is not a book about social media. This is about how consumer behavior is changing and how consumers are changing how they make decisions. And more importantly, how they influence and are influenced by one another. Do you know what I found? is that there isn't any one type of consumer anymore. There's several classes of consumer, being this idea of a connected consumer. Businesses are good at trying to reach everybody. But how a connected consumer, how you and I make decisions, is not at all how our parents make decisions. It's not at all how our aunts and uncles make decisions. So why would a business try to reach us all the same way? The idea is that here's to what extent a connected customer is impacting your business. The second half is... Here's how you bring about change in the organization, because that's the hardest part. I can't win with any executive with a social media conversation. I can't tell you, Twitter is huge. Facebook is huge. Do you, you have to believe me. We need to change our business. They're going to say, are you, are you kidding me? I don't use Facebook. My kids use Facebook. What we have to do is just demonstrate by data, by trends. This is to what extent all of this is changing, and here's what we need to do about it. Here's how to build a change management team. Here's how change within the organization is going to be great. Here's how it's going to work for employees. So it's a bigger struggle, and it's not a struggle that's going to be one about so with social media. It's going to be one because we understand who our connected customers are and how they impact the bottom line and what we need to do about it. My last question, which is my favorite question, actually, is uh, what is the question that nobody ever asks you but you think is really relevant at the moment? That, I, I don't even know how to answer that question. That, uh, that might be the question that nobody ever asks me. <laughs> <laughs> I will say this, though. I am asked all the time about social media. I really believe that if you care about the future of business or customer relationships or just connectivity, um, and relationships in general, we have, to, we have to look beyond social media. So I'm always asked about social media. I'm never asked about what does this mean for the greater impact on culture, society, business, governments. Those are the conversations that I have. That, that's, that's what inspires all of my writing, by the way. It's this bigger impact, not right here in social media. I, I often tell people, people who are very passionate about social media, I don't, I don't want them to not be passionate. It's passion that is actually driving innovation and transformation right now. What I would love to talk to people about is to look at life right now as this. We're at a crossroads. And on one path, you can continue to be a social media champion. You can look at the impact of Facebook and Twitter and emerging networks on your business and how to improve relationships with your customers, stakeholders, employees, 
using social networks. Somebody has to lead that charge. But it is going to be just one of the channels that a business is going to use. On the other path, that's the change agent. That's somebody who recognizes that all of this stuff, all of the lessons that we're getting from this side is so important, so profound, mm -hmm. that it's going to bring about greater change within the organization, but we're not ready for it. That change agent has to go and work with executives, has to work with stakeholders, and has to do all of the things that brings about change. It's a distinct path unto itself. Both are important. Which path are you on? I started on social media path. I have moved over to the change agent path because that, to me, is where we are really going to have an impact on how business view, businesses view customers, how governments view constituents or voters. It's how we just build better relationships that improve the experiences for everybody. Brian, I thank you very much for being with us today.